First and foremost, we want to welcome you to BCC. You made a tremendous choice by coming here. There's a lot of great opportunities for you along with great faculty and great staff to help you along the way. Um, what today really is about is you getting, uh, giving you a basic rundown of what to expect that first semester. With that, I'm going to ask how many recently graduated high school within the past couple months here? All right, most of you. All right, so this is going to be a new experience for you. The rest of you, how many of you that are students has it been a, few, uh, a year or more since you've been in high school or college? All right, that's pretty much what our average classroom looks like. There's a lot of people that are directly out of high school, maybe a year or two, and then we have a lot of people that are, uh, half our students are 25 years old or older. So we have a nice mix within our classroom. So if you look around, that's what your classroom, classrooms are gonna look like. What today really is about is getting you comfortable with what to expect that first semester. And by doing that, we're gonna spend about an hour in here with uh, Christina and I presenting some information to you. Um, and the other piece will actually bring you over to K, uh, the K building. We'll sit in a computer lab and we'll actually build your schedule. So when you leave today, you're actually going to have your schedule in hand. Um, you're gonna know where your classes are. You'll have something to go to the bookstore with. And does anyone here still need a BCC ID card? All right, we'll make sure you get your BCC ID card. Last thing, is everyone taking classes here in Fall River? All right, great. How about in New Bedford? Great. Attleboro? Good one. All right, and anybody going to talk? Okay, so we've got people here going to all our campuses, and you can go to any of our campuses, or you can go to a multiple, any multiple of the campuses if you want. You want to take a class in Fall River and New Bedford, that's fine too. Just make sure you can physically get from point A to point B when, before the class starts. Um, the one thing I did want to point out about New Bedford with parking there is that we now have free parking on the campus. So you can actually go to either the Zyterian garage or the Elm Street garage with your ID and your schedule and you can actually get free parking at one of those garages. So you no longer have to feed the meter and, and dodge the meter made. So uh, first thing I'd like to get started with is a welcome and also a list of um, some helpful, helpful uh, tips from our recent graduates from the college. very same question you're uh, brave enough to ask, but if you need to ask us privately or if it's a personal matter, please, there's gonna be plenty of us available for you today to, to speak up and uh, get that question answered. Uh, we can answer a lot of things. One thing we don't really answer on is financial aid, because if there's 40 people in this room right now, there's 40 different financial aid uh, possibilities out there. So we will send you to financial aid, and hopefully they can give you the best possible answer available. So in the beginning, we're just gonna review a couple things. Everybody here has applied to the college, and the next question becomes your financial aid. If you have not started your financial aid, the classes start a week from uh, tomorrow, and I would just want you to know that your financial aid would not be completed by tomorrow, or within a week. So with that said, you need to have find an alternate way of uh, making sure that you're gonna pay for your classes. Um, on everybody's transcript, there's a list uh, we listed up where your financial aid is at this point in time. So if it says FA and a check mark next to it, it means that you've done what you're supposed to do and your financial aid is complete. 
if it has fi financial aid and a laundry list of things to do, what you need to do is actually get those things completed before you leave campus today or come back and do them tomorrow. Why? Because you'll be removed from your classes for non-payment. We'll go over that um, concept again in a minute. And the last thing, if it says financial aid, or I'm sorry, if it says no FAFSA, it means you have not started your financial aid. If that's the case, then most likely you will need to find an alternative way of paying for classes. Everyone here has taken four placement tests, a reading test, a written English test, a math test, and an algebra test. We actually use those scores to place you in your classes today. So if you had a bad day the day you tested, and those scores literally don't represent who you are, um, you are allowed to test one more time, just understanding that we start classes in about a week and there aren't that many opportunities for you to retest. So you get a very limited window to get that done. We also require that you give us a copy of your immunization records. That's your shot records from when you're a little baby right on up until now. Um, your immunization records, uh, most likely when you left high school, they handed you a pile of papers. It's probably right in the middle of those. Our nurse in G200 would require you to give her a copy of those. And with that, basically, um, it's not something you have to do today, but we'd like it done within, let's say, by, by the end of October. If you don't do that, it'll make it um, a hold be placed on your account and you can no longer sign up for your spring classes. So it'll put you behind an eight ball. But for the most part, we want you to get, make sure you get us your immunization records by let's say Halloween. And the last thing uh, on that one's first side here is, um, do we have anybody using veterans benefits to pay for their classes? If you do have any veterans or whether it's your own um, VA uh, benefits or your parents, you need to visit our veterans benefits officers. They are in G220 to get the ball rolling there. Have you started to do that yet? Perfect. Okay, up here it now says, don't forget to do, pay your bill by August 10th. That was obviously a couple weeks ago. So we are looking for payment as soon as you sign up for your classes. So this is where if you haven't completed your financial aid, you might have to take action. And there's ways for you to pay us. Uh, we'd never send you a bill in the mail. The only way we will send you a bill, it's, it's on your Access BCC link. When you go to your Access BCC link, it'll show you how much you owe, and you, and you can pay directly there with credit card or check. You can sign up for a payment plan, which breaks down your payment into a couple different um, lump sums that we pay, rather than paying all up front. Or you can actually go to the student accounts and pay in person on campus if you'd like to do that but we are looking for payment as soon as you sign up for classes. Any questions on that? All right. Also says here, for students that are taking nine credits or more, we need you to waive your health insurance. The state requires that you uh, that you, each student has health, uh, has health insurance. If you don't have health insurance, the state requires that we will give it to you. If you do have health insurance, whether it's for your parents, through work, or through another family member, you need to go to your Access BCC account and waive your health insurance. It's not the simplest, easy thing to do, but we're going to show you in the next session how you get that done. And make sure you do that because it'll save you $1,712. It'll take you about 15 minutes to do it. Saves you $1,700. It's usually a pretty good deal to get that done. Um, the bookstore is available and, early, and open at this point in time, so you can get your books. Obviously, you're not going to be too early. Um, if if you have any questions about your books, your best place to go is to email your instructor. If you're questioning whether you can get the book cheaper elsewhere, you are allowed to, to uh, search the web and try to get it. Just be a little careful where you go and, and also what their return, uh, return policies are. If you do get a book from our bookstore and it's wrapped, don't unwrap it. Keep it in its uh, shrink wrap until uh, your, your instructor says, yes, you need the book uh, or you need that particular book. And we'll check with Office of Disability Services in just a little bit. Some best practices here that we always have to talk about. And uh, failures, withdrawals, and incompletes are right on the top of that. Failure, I'm sure you all knew somebody in high school failed the class. What they have to do, they had to repeat the class. Here in college, it's a little different. If your program requires that you need that class, you are going to, get, first of all, get the pleasure of paying for that class. And then when you want to realize that you need that class for your program, you're going to have to pay for the class again. 
So we want you to take ownership of what you're doing as of today. If you're signing up for classes, please go to class. Please turn in your homework. Follow your syllabus because you need to take ownership of that ownership of that starting day one. So if you don't meet the criteria of the classroom, the instructor has the right to fail. A withdrawal is a little bit different. That's something that a student can do, and you can withdraw yourself up to the tenth week of classes. Withdrawal means that something changed in your life, or and you just want to remove yourself from the class. If you fail the class, it affects your GPA. If you withdraw from the class, it doesn't affect your GPA, but it does show up on your permanent record as a withdrawal. Having one or two of them in your your time here at BCC isn't a horrible thing, but you want to try not to have a lot of them because it does affect your academic standing at some point in time. Last thing up there, which is unique to college, is an incomplete. What an incomplete is, it simply means I see you in class every week. You show up, you turned in all your assignments, passed all your tests, and maybe she disappears the last couple of weeks of school. Maybe she had a family uh, emergency or she had a uh, got ill, broke her leg, got in a car accident. All of a sudden, she stopped showing up to class. The ability of an incomplete is something that the instructor has and can allow a student um, to complete the course the following semester. So it gives you as a student another semester to complete that course. So it's really of a benefit to you. The nice thing about an incomplete is you won't get charged for the, uh, to take, to, uh, you won't have to pay for the class for a second time. You don't start at the beginning with me, you start right where we left off. So if you owe me a final and a final project, you get those to me, I get your final letter grade to you. And really, it's up to you to really take advantage of that. It's not something you can ask the instructor usually for, it's something the instructor will recognize in you that you've done your work up until a certain point and then all of a sudden you may have had a, a tough spot in your life or something going on. So that's what an incomplete is. First two weeks of any semester is what we call the add drop period. That's sort of like our shakeout period. That means that you can add or drop a class during that period. You may have signed yourself up for five classes today and all of a sudden you realize that might be too much because you're working a bunch of hours or so on. So you may want to drop a class that first week or two. Well, you might say, hey, I can handle another class and you can add a class. So the first two weeks of classes are designated as drop period. And by doing that, you simply can add or drop a class. Now, just don't assume that everything's going to be perfect when you do that. Uh, make sure you're working with financial aid if you are receiving financial aid or student's account to make sure you don't owe additional money or if you have money coming back, uh, how to get that money back. So make sure you're, you're not just uh, leaving it alone. You need to talk to somebody in uh, most likely in G building in the enrollment center. So what's the benefit of a drop versus a withdrawal? A drop simply means it doesn't show up on your record ever. It means that you have complied to the college's rules within the first two weeks and it doesn't show up on your record. If you withdraw, it does show up on your record and you're going to be charged a larger portion of the total cost of that class. So it'll save you money by dropping class rates and withdrawal. We, we uh, work on a 4.0 GPA requirement. You need at least a 2.0 to graduate. 2.0 is a C average. I want you all to aim much higher than that, especially if you want to transfer to a four-year school. They're going to be looking for a higher GPA than that. Any questions there? That's a good. All right, college etiquette. You guys are all being quiet and attentive. You're all being very, um, you're all paying attention, which is the great thing about uh, college etiquette, but I know this is going to wear off real soon. So um, we want a couple of things here that were mentioned in that first video. Be on time. And that's really one of the, the key key things about college, be on time. Be here, just don't be here physically, be here in spirit. So be able to um, do a couple of those things that are listed there, such as participate and show up to class prepared. And there's a rule of thumb with college. When you're in high school, you probably went there from 7.30 in the morning to three o'clock in the afternoon. You were there 35 to 40 hours a week, is that right? Yeah, okay. So you're there a, a large amount of time. If you're a full-time student here taking 12 credits, you're, which is four classes, you're gonna be here about 12 to 13 hours a week in class. So it's a completely different dichotomy of how learning gets done. It's completely different. The whole thing gets flipped on you. So instead of being in class and learning everything from what's in the book and what definitions are, 
you're going to be expected to do things on your own. So the rule of thumb is for every hour you're in class, you're going to spend two to three hours outside of class studying, doing homework, going to the library, writing papers, preparing for a, a lab, all these things. So even though I told you you're only going to be in class 12 or 13 hours a week, you're going to have another 24 to 30 hours of work outside of the classroom. You add that together, being a full-time student is like, being, is like having a full-time job. It's 40 plus hours of work. Yeah, some weeks you'll get away with a little less, but at some point in time, it's going to catch up to you. So be, be cognizant of that. We're going to expect that you show up to class prepared, meaning you read the assignment so that we can have a conversation in class. And it's just so when we're in class, the things I'm saying isn't the first time you're hearing it. You can be a little more immersed in the subject matter. You can ask me better questions, or we can have a conversation rather than me downloading information to you. Um, that second item up there is your cell phones. We all got them, we all love them. Please follow your, your instructor's lead in the class. They will tell you if they want to see them or not. If you have an emergency and you really need to keep it up on your desk, make sure you're, uh, you let your instructor know. Some instructors don't want to see them. Other instructors will have you use them within the classroom. Any questions there thus far? Yeah. Okay. We're going to expect you to check your email and check it often. You're going to get a unique BCC email address here. And you can do that by checking either uh, downloading the app and checking your email there. But you can also check it by going to your Access BCC link. When you go to your Access BCC link, all your information is going to be there. I'm going to tell you to check your email at least once a day. If it would be your benefit to check it even more. That is really the only way the college and your instructors have to communicate with you. So if I'm going to cancel class for tomorrow, and I'm going to email my class that I'm not going to be there, I can click a couple buttons in my Access BCC and get that information out to you. I'm not going to check what your personal emails are. I'm not going to check how you emailed me last time we spoke. I'm going to send it in a general email out to my students. And if they get that information, they're going to be very thankful that they didn't have to get up at 6 a.m. to be here for a meeting in class. So use this to your benefit. In most cases, instructors will not answer your private email like that, uh, uh, inquiries. So if you're asking them um, what to do for next week, I might not want to answer an AOL or a Gmail account. But if you email me through Access BCC, I know it's a student. And I don't know it's, uh, I'm, I'm, protect, I'm doing this basically to protect the privacy of your account. Because we don't want to give out any information to anybody else that isn't the student. So we're doing it as an act of privacy. Any questions on that? That last piece there is syllabus. And a syllabus is, was required by every, um, is required by every instructor in every class to have that. It's a college requirement. Um, what a syllabus is, and some of you might have got them in high school, Essentially, it's a list of all the rules of the class. I'm going to play a really quick video. He's going to do a very good job of explaining that syllabus. And then we'll talk a little bit more. At the start of every semester, each professor will give you a syllabus. Some like to keep them short, others make them 10 pages. But no matter what the size, it tells you what's going on in the course. It tells you how the course is structured and what the professor plans on teaching you. It tells you which books to buy, when assignments are due, and when to have certain chapters read. It includes how much each test or assignment is worth. But more importantly, it tells you exactly what the professor is looking for in each assignment or test. Use your syllabi to plan your semester. Once you have all of your information together, you can figure out when to study for tests, when to have assignments finished, and when you can fit in that trip back home. University isn't a high school. You're expected to keep track of your own deadlines, your own duties, and your own responsibilities. The best way to do that is with the syllabus. All right, so the whole idea of learning changes between high school and college, and that's one of the, the big differences there. Things are gonna be plopped on your lap, and you're gonna have, if you're in four or five classes, you're gonna have four or five syllabi to sort of try to figure out what's going on with your life for the next three months. Now, if you notice, he had a little kitty cat calendar, and he sort of plotted out when things were due, and it's not going to be as easy and pretty as his is, you're going to have five tests one week. You're going to have five tests and three papers due within uh, 
seven school days. How do you get that done? And by using your time management skills, which is something you're going to learn in your CSS classes, that's what's going to get you through it. And by using the resources at the school and learning the best, um, the best methods of how to study for a particular class, that's how you get through these things. So you need to really use the resources of the school. One last thing I want to point out on this slide here, it's absences from class when you're in high school. If you took a day off because you had to go to a doctor's, you might have left school at about 11 o'clock, went to lunch, and then went to the doctor's office, and you called it a day. As I mentioned earlier, earlier you're only going to see your instructor for a particular class for about two and a half hours. That's a, that's a very limited face time you have with your instructor. It's valuable time. So I want you really to go to class. So you have a doctor's appointment, dentist appointment, you have a job interview, or, you have a, or you're working, schedule those things around your class time. If you can't do that now, you're really going to put yourself behind the eight ball. Every syllabus is going to have a maximum number of classes you miss. After you miss that maximum number of classes, even if you're doing super really well in that class, the instructor can flunk you. So keep that in mind. Questions on that? ODS, um, Office of Disability Service. If you had a 501 plan, an IEP, or, a, or, or a accommodations in high school, that information does not follow you from high school to here. You must advocate for yourself and visit the very nice people in L Building on this campus and get your accommodations in place for um, your classes. What are accommodations? Accommodations could be a little more time uh, you're allowed for taking a test might be, mean you need a quiet area to take a test, or it could be that you need a note taker to help you in the classroom. None of these things are, are ever, um, these are all private matters and it's kept between you, ODS, and the instructor, but the ODS needs time to get these things for you. So if you do need these services, go see them today or tomorrow. Make sure that these, um, uh, uh, these resources are in, in place for you within the classroom. If you don't do that, you're going to find yourself maybe struggling when you don't need to. So get involved with them. There's information in your backpacks about ODS, so make sure you see them as soon as possible. We have a number of resources at the school. Uh, Christina and I are academic advisors. We're here to help you get from point A to point B. I'm just going to briefly touch on a couple of these. Um, we have a tremendous library right located in A building. They have a number of resources. On the back of your ID card is your library card. You're going to have to get that activated. When that's activated, it'll give you access to about the 70 or 80 different um, websites, uh, uh, academic websites and journals that we have available for you online. When you use those websites, essentially it's, it's private information. Um, you think you can get a lot of information on Google, but a lot of it's um, maybe not be what your instructor is looking for. Quite often they're looking for what they call peer reviewed or editor, edited articles which are reviewed by a, a group of editors or uh, experts in the field. So that they know that the information you're reading is perfect. It's not just someone's idea that probably that they came up in the, uh, you know, off the top of your head, which isn't based in fact or reality. The other piece there is the Learning Commons. The Learning Commons is made up of both the Writing Center and the tutoring center. They're located in B building on this campus, but all these resources are located on all campuses. What's great about the tutoring center and our learning commons is that you can go there and get tutoring for free in any subject matter. Struggling in a particular class, you can get help there. The nice thing about the, uh, our learning commons is that most of the students that go there are A and B students trying to maintain those A and B. We also have a lot of students that go there that are C and D students trying to maybe maybe get that C up to a B or get that D and feel a little bit better about the knowledge you're learning. It's a way for you to just um, have a one-on-one -on -one session with someone else. These are free of charge services. They're available to you on campus starting day one. Make sure you use them. And they're also there to help you with any term papers you have, any writing assignments you have, um, and also the library's there to help you with researching um, any topics there. And the last one here, before I kick it over to Christina, is coming up this Wednesday from about 10 a.m. We have BCC Day One, which is a brand new event here. 
Um, it's really an opportunity for you to get to meet some of your instructors, advisors, and fellow students. So we're going to have about 300 students here already. We'd like to have a few more, so why don't you, um, there's information in your backpacks about this, but make sure you sign up for this so we know you're coming and we can have some food available for you. And also a nice uh, thing is we're going to raffle off a couple of uh, laptops. Um, the president will be speaking. So it's a really nice day. We, we think you'll enjoy it. All right, everyone, my name is Christina. As John mentioned, I'm another advisor here on campus. We are going to switch topics just a little bit and talk a little bit more about the advising and registration components of orientation. This is my plug to tell you, too, that you should be meeting with an advisor every semester. What we do today is something that should carry with you in every semester while you're at college so that you're planning appropriate coursework, taking classes that apply to your major, and making sure that you're taking classes that fit within your schedule. So one of the first questions that I ask a student whenever I meet with them for course selection is, do you need to be full-time? Some students come in right off the rip and they know, yes, I'm a full-time student, this is my plan, this is all I'm doing is coming to class. Great, then I'll make sure that you're registered for at least 12 or more credits. So full-time enrollment, just to reiterate, is 12 or more credits. Most of our courses are worth three credits. We have a handful that are worth one, some that are worth four, but the majority of our classes are three credits. So to be full-time, that's at least 12 credits or more. If you don't know if you need to be a full-time student or if you want to be a full-time student, there are some instances where you have to be full-time. If I have anyone in the room interested in participating in one of our athletic teams, you absolutely have to be a full-time student in order to be eligible to play. That means 12 or more credits. Specifically for student athletes, we need to get you in morning classes that end before 1, 2 o'clock so that you're able to make it to games and practices. The next part, the financial aid part, as John mentioned, financial aid is really a world in and of itself. So we encourage you to touch base with financial aid, especially when you look on your paperwork, if you do see a list of to-do items for financial aid. There's no general statement in here that I could say that everyone has to be full-time in order for your financial aid to be applied. So this is more just more or less a reminder for you to check in with the office. Not that we're gonna be able to answer all those questions, but again, please make sure you touch base so that your classes are able to be paid for. John did mention on your paperwork, there is a laundry list of things that you might need to do. If not, then talk to us to see if you need to set up a payment plan. They are gonna drop students tomorrow for non-payment. So if you register for classes today and no payment is made, they're just gonna erase your classes tomorrow. That doesn't mean that you can't come back in tomorrow and re-pick those classes out, but if you somehow snag a, a seat in a Monday, Wednesday at 9.30, and there's another student over here that really wants it, chances are they're gonna see that and grab it before you're able to re-register. So that's just the reason why we wanna make sure that you guys check in with financial aid and or student accounts to make sure you can secure the classes that you select today. That last piece there, the two-year plan, a lot of students come into a community college and they say, great, it's a two-year school. I'm in and out in two years. I can transfer. I can go out into the work field. Yes and no. You can absolutely complete your associate's degree in two years, but in order to do that, you have to know how many credits your program is worth. So at a minimum, all of our associate degrees will be worth 60 credits. In order to complete those 60 credits in two years, under a traditional academic year, meaning the fall semester and spring semester, two years, four semesters, 60 credits divided by four semesters is 15. So in order to get your 60 credit degree program done in two years, you wanna be registered for 15 credits per semester. So if two years is your plan, then yep, you wanna be full time and you wanna crank it up a bit to 15 credits versus 12. Now, I'm about to show you a couple of visuals just to sort of get the wheels turning, just so you guys have an idea of how long do I wanna be here for, how many classes do I wanna take, and what does that sort of path look like for me? So these time frame for degree completion. This isn't something that you guys have to follow to a T. Again, it's just a visual. But this first one you see here is very much a full-time schedule. So you're looking at the traditional two-year plan, four semesters, and you've got 15 credits at least per semester. So again, very much a full-time schedule here. Take a student about two years to complete their degree this way. What this example and the next two examples do not take into consideration is any developmental coursework you may need. So a developmental class is a result of your placement exam, the English reading or math, and essentially what a developmental course is is a pre-college level course based on one of those topics that really have to make sure that we get you guys sort of like get that foundational skills like 
put together. Make sure that your skills in math are concrete before we throw you into a college level math. So for some students, they might not be able to start with Math 119 in their first semester because that's their college level math. They need some developmental coursework ahead of time, maybe arithmetic, maybe algebra. So if you're not able to start with that college level work in your first semester, then we need to prioritize those developmental courses and get those done as soon as possible so that we don't delay your college level work too far. This is just another instance where I would say, please make sure you're meeting with an advisor, be it a faculty advisor or a professional advisor, to make sure that you are staying on track. Get those developmental courses done ASAP so that it doesn't delay your college level work and so it doesn't delay how long you want to be here for. So again, very much a full-time example. You're looking at five to six classes per semester. A lot of our students gravitate towards a part-time schedule. So you're looking at maybe three to four, two classes each semester. Anything under 12 credits is considered part-time. So even if it's 11, that's a part-time, three-quarter time schedule. You will notice in this example that a student is taking advantage of our summer session. We do offer a handful of classes over the summer, but something to note about the summer is it's an accelerated session versus our traditional fall and spring. So your fall and spring semesters are 15 weeks in length, fall and spring. The summer is going to be taking essentially a 15 week class and putting it into either 11 weeks or seven weeks, depending on the schedule of the summer session. So the summer's a nice way to kind of keep the ball rolling, stay in the, in the uh, mentality of going to school, but it will be a quicker paced semester versus the fall and the spring. The other thing is to make sure you check with financial aid because there is a, a vast majority of students that aren't able to have their summer classes covered by financial aid and that usually results in an out-of-pocket expense. So again, just make sure you're checking with your financial aid status. This right here, part-time schedule is going to take a person about three years to complete. So not too far off of that two-year mark. This final example might be a little dramatic. It's one class at a time, super dedicated student. It's going to take them about seven years to complete their associate's degree going one class at a time. Now all these examples are meant to do, again, is just to get you thinking. We're not saying one way is right and the other way is wrong. But at the end of the day, make sure you're taking the coursework, the amount of classes, the types of classes that's conducive to your personal life as well. We know that a good majority of you probably work, maybe have family obligations, maybe your commute is like an hour, hour and a half. Take all of those things into consideration when you think about how many classes you want to register for. This isn't a rat race. It might take you a little bit longer than two years, but if you're here and you're doing it successfully and this is a positive experience for you, then that's really what you should be focusing on. Questions on time frame for degree completion. Again, make, that decision is yours and we're gonna help guide you through that. All right, so I had mentioned that those examples don't take into consideration those developmental courses. So what we're gonna do is talk a little bit more about your developmental course options. Now when everyone checked in, you guys all got some paperwork, so if you don't have it in front of you, this is a good time to take it out. Um, we're going to go over the results of your placement exam. I'll give everyone a second to kind of shuffle through that. Now I know there are some students in the room that might have just did their placement test or maybe just did it yesterday. So we may not have those final scores in this moment, but when we go next door to register for classes, we will make sure that we have all those scores and help direct you into what classes you should be looking for. So on your paperwork, and if I can maybe steal somebody's, thank you ma'am. So everyone got their transcripts, it has your name, your major, your placement scores. What we've done is we've interpreted those placement scores. So you don't have to worry about what a 39 on the arithmetic means. We're gonna go through those for you. So on the back, you should have a sheet that looks like this. And we did a little bit of pre-advising. And what I mean by that is we've interpreted your English reading and math scores and we've made recommendations based on those scores. On your sheet, if you see anything that starts with a zero, that's indicating developmental coursework is needed. And as I mentioned, please make sure that those courses are priority. Get those done in your first semester so it doesn't delay your college level work. So on that second row where it says MTH, that's math. We're going to go over a couple of math options right now. If you see anything that starts with a 1, like Math 119, 125, 152, you can go ahead and ignore me. But anything that starts with a 0, please make sure you guys understand your options. So your math options. Whether you need arithmetic, algebra, intermediate algebra, those first two examples, the Math 001, 011, 021, 031, the content in those courses are the same. 
So if you need arithmetic, 001 is arithmetic, 011 is arithmetic. The difference is the way that the course is taught, so the method of instruction is different. 001 is a computer-based math course. You'd be in a computer lab on campus doing all of the learning, all of the work on a computer. There's a faculty member in the room to offer assistance, but they're not going to be lecturing up front because the other thing about the computer-based math class is everyone is at different places. So you could be on chapter one while you're on four, while you're on seven, and there's no real way that a professor can lecture to that. That's the other thing about computer-based math is some students like the fact that they can go at their own pace. So if you're really good at fraction, fractions, fractions, I was gonna say decimals and fractions. If you're really good at fractions, you could blow through that chapter maybe in a couple days. But if you need a little time on another subject, you can spend that time on that other subject. End of the day, you just have to ask yourself, am I comfortable doing work on a computer? The other option, if you're like, absolutely not, I don't want to do work on a computer, is the math 011, 021, 031 options. That's going to be your traditional lecture classroom setting. So probably a classroom setting most people are used to. Professors in front of the board, in front of the room lecturing, putting notes on the board. Everyone's going at the same pace. So week one is fractions, week two is decimals, so forth and so on. So just to reiterate, the content is the same. So if you need arithmetic, both options are going to get you arithmetic. It's just you have to indicate, do you prefer to do it in per, uh, excuse me, traditional lecture or based on a computer? So everyone should have a pen in their backpack or hopefully with them. Maybe make a quick star next to the one that you are interested in taking so that when we go next door and register you, you already have an idea of what's going to be the best, the best fit. This last example is very student specific and very program specific. So it may not apply to everyone in here, but I do want to go through it. Math 060 with Math 119 or 125 is a combination math course. And what it does is it pairs developmental algebra with the college level math required by the student's program. So again, it's very program specific and dependent on where you place in your placement results. The combination course pairs those two together, thereby allowing a student essentially to get all their math requirements done in one semester. Doesn't delay that college level work. So the 060 is the developmental algebra piece, and then the 119 or 125 is the college level piece required by a program. Question? So you get the credit for the thing that happened? Absolutely. So, great point to mention. Math 001, 011, 021, 031, those do, the credits that for that class do not apply to your degree. Any developmental coursework does not go towards your program. What it will go towards is to your enrollment. So if you're taking four classes this semester and one of them is that math class, the math 001, and the other three are college level courses, you're, you're considered full time, you're in 12 credits. But at the end of the semester when you pass all four classes, you're only gonna earn credit for the three college level. So it's really like you're only earning credit for three classes versus four. Now that math 060 and 119, 125 is a five credit option. Two credits worth of developmental work and three credits worth of college level work. So at the end of the semester, if you take 060 and 119, you do earn three credits towards your program because of that college level piece that's incorporated. Does that answer your question? Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, great. Any questions on math? Like math class questions, not actual math problem questions, because I'm not that math person. Everyone knows the kind of math they're gonna take? If not, there's advisors over there, we're gonna help you. The next piece is your English. So if you can go to that top line where it says ENG-RDG, that's your English and, writing, uh, in English and reading scores. Now some students may have placed right into English 101 or 102. That's fantastic. You guys place into college level work. You can sort of ignore me. But if anyone sees again that zero, that zero coursework, here are some integrated English options. Now for some students that might have placed both into English 090 and reading 090, those are two separate courses. Uh, developmental reading and writing. But what the English department has done is they've offered this combined course called English 091. And what's nice about the 091 is that you take your reading and writing and you push them together. So instead of having two separate courses, two different instructors, two set of assignments, two sets of books, you now have one of each, one instructor, one set of assignments, one textbook. Essentially, you're writing about what you're reading about, which if you think about it, makes a lot of sense. Now again, this is very uh, uh, specific to based on your placement test. 
and if it does apply to you, it is written on your paperwork. I would encourage anyone that places into the 091 or 092 to try your best to fit it onto your schedule. It really just makes a lot of sense for you guys to take these courses and again, get you through the developmental coursework in an efficient way so that, again, you don't delay that college level work too much. English 092 is for my students that need English 090, so you needed a little bit of work on the English placement test, but it pairs English 101 with it. So it's very similar to that last math option. It pairs developmental writing with college level writing. So again, two classes that normally were separate combined into one. Both of these options, 091 and 092, are six credits each. So please keep that in mind as you schedule um, your courses that these will be six credits versus three. Questions on English. Alrighty. As John mentioned, if you guys aren't very satisfied with your placement results, you do have the option to retake it one time. If you've taken it twice, that's it. But if you've only taken it once, we obviously encourage some preparation so that you guys can retest. For today's purposes, we have to put you in classes based on whatever your current scores are, but if you have a retest scheduled for tomorrow, then you would just meet with an advisor after that retest to make adjustments. From an advisor's point of view, we help build schedules on a daily basis, so we just put together a couple tips that we talk to students about every day. When you're building your schedule, this might be your first time at putting together your own academic schedule. As John mentioned, a lot of people coming from high school, you are in class 730 to 3, no ifs, ands, or buts. But here in college, you're really in the driver's seat as far as when you take classes, where you take classes, how many classes. So that first one right there, how many classes, let us know how many you want to take. Let us know how many you need to take, want to take, are comfortable with taking. Please utilize that add drop period again in the first two weeks of every semester. So that if you register for a ton of classes today and then it doesn't seem like it's going to be the most successful semester, take advantage of that last opportunity to make adjustments. Whenever you're scheduling classes, you need to check prerequisites. A prerequisite is something that has to be done before you take whatever class you're looking at. So if you're interested in child development because you really want to take psychology, the prerequisite to child development is Psych 101, meaning you can't take Psych 252 without doing Psych 101 first. We're going to show you in the next room how to find prerequisites, but please just keep an eye on that because you might run into that um, in terms of scheduling. For my full-time students, I am encouraging you to spread your schedule out over the course of the week. Four or five days, whatever is conducive again to your personal schedule. One of the main reasons why we want you to spread it out if you're taking four or five classes is think about midterms and finals. If you've got five classes on Monday, Wednesday, there's a really good percent chance that on Wednesday you're going to have five midterms or five finals. And that is quite overwhelming to think about, right? You have your finals and there are five tests on one day. So we really want you to spread it out the best that you possibly can. Um, class options. When you're searching the schedule, classes meet once a week for two hours and 40 minutes or twice a week for an hour and 15. So essentially you're in the classroom for the same amount of time. But it's up to you, do you want to get it done one day, once a week, two hours and 40 minutes, or do you want to split it up twice a week, an hour and 15 each? And we're gonna show you how to search that schedule. We have a handful of evening courses that start at 4 p.m. and 7 p.m. We also have some weekend classes, depending on, again, what works for your schedule. And then we also have something called a fully online or hybrid course. A fully online class, what does that mean? You do not come to campus. You do all of the work, all of the learning, anywhere you have internet access, right? So you can do it from home at 2 a.m. If, if that's what works best for you. Please don't confuse a fully online class with being easier than an in-person class. I say to students, if you wanna take online classes, please make sure your time management skills are like way up here and that your motivation is way up here. It's super easy to fall behind in an online course because you don't have that person in front of you reminding you and clarifying. There's still a faculty member attached to an online course, but again, if you're kind of easily distracted or maybe you procrastinate a lot, an online class might not be the best option. A hybrid is an interesting way, though, to sort of get your feet wet with online work. So a hybrid course has an in-person component and also has an online component. So it's kind of like the best of both worlds. So if you're thinking about online, a hybrid might be a good place to start because at least you still have that in-person meeting once or twice um, a week. Questions, concerns, comments for the good of the order? No? Yes, ma'am. Um, can I make 
I'll talk to you in two seconds. Okay. Cool. All right. So what we're going to do actually, oh, I'm jumping ahead of myself. I apologize. I don't think we have any culinary arts or hospitality people in here. If we do, you can kind of come talk to me in one second. But one of the last things we want you to know is we want students to be informed every step of the way through college. And one way to do that is we're taking advantage of the fact that everybody has a cell phone. So everyone's been great. I don't think I've seen a cell phone out the entire time. But now would be a great chance to actually take them out and play with them a little bit. What we've done is we've created a couple text info um, locations for you guys to go to. So it's a free service. Standard text messaging rates do apply, but hopefully everyone has unlimited uh, packages at this point. But one way to stay in the know is to know your academic pro, um, requirements. So if you want to be reminded of deadlines, like the ad drop period, when advising starts, that you can get a perfect schedule for the spring, when the last day to withdraw is, then you can text BCC info to that number right up there, which is 67283. By texting to this, you are opting in to get that email, excuse me, that text message notification that, hey, tomorrow's the last day to drop your classes, or advising starts next week, make an appointment with your advisor now. We're not gonna spam you, it's really just to keep you in the know with some of these important dates and deadlines. Right underneath that, you're gonna see, yes sir? I just have a question, um, so you know how BCC and info are like one kind of together? Yep. Have to be together yeah. I would do it together, right. yep. Um, the other one though right underneath that is be notified and it's the same number 67283 If you don't sign up for all of them at least sign up for this one Be notified is going to alert you when the campus is closed maybe to a weather related emergency or god forbid an actual emergency on campus You don't want to be driving to school only to find out that we were closed because a water main burst And that happened So I would text be notified to that number as well. Yes ma'am Oh, great. All right, so if anyone else is getting any sort of error messages, I will find out from communications, because they put this together. I'm just the messenger. Um, anybody else, is anyone getting an actual confirmation, though, by text? OK, so some people got confirmations. All right, I'm not going to say that it's just you, but we will touch base to make sure that it's not just you. Um, I'm going to leave this up for a second. Uh, what we're going to do, though, in this next portion is I'm going to split you guys up a bit. There's just a big group. We don't want to cram you into one computer lab. But what we're going to do is go into the next computer room and make sure that you guys understand your program requirements. So big thing, you guys, when it comes to registering for classes is knowing what classes you need to take, right? So we're going to show you your program requirements, then we're going to show you a course search so that you guys know how to actually find the courses you need to take. Before you leave the next room, you're going to check out with an advisor to make sure that your classes look good to go. And then we'll send you on your way for any housekeeping items, such as getting a ID, checking with financial aid, so forth and so on. All right, so I 